Sins of the Fathers by Jeremy Burnham Alone in his office late at night, managing director Trevor Radford typed up a letter on the headed note paper of Radford's brewery. He pulled the sheets out of the typewriter and screwed the carbon paper into a ball, throwing it into the waste paper basket. Then he took the top copy of the letter and set fire to it, leaving it to burn in the ashtray, while he put the other one into the safe and locked it. He came out of his office on the top floor of the brewery and started to hurry down the metal staircase which led to the ground floor. Bradford's was a huge old building like a warehouse. The offices on one side connected by a tracery of balconies, platforms and ladders to the brewing floor. At this time of night it was full of shadows. As he rounded a corner a noise behind him made him turn and freeze horrified for a split second. And a hooded figure brought a hammer crashing down onto Trevor Radford's skull. Hey! Hey! Come here! Early next morning, the head brewer dragged his colleagues over to a hatch halfway up one of the huge vats, and they saw, half buried in the chaff that lay at the bottom, the twisted body of Trevor Radford. Chief Inspector Morse was breakfasting off Alka-Seltzer when the doorbell rang. He answered it wearily. It was Detective Sergeant Lewis. You'll never believe this, sir. We have to visit a brewery. Trevor Radford, Managing Director of Radford & Sons. One of the brewers found him at the bottom of a vat. Just like poor old Clarence. Sounds like a pretty good way to go. Morse and Lewis drew up outside the city centre brewery, which was already busy with police. They climbed the staircase to where the body was laid out and found the pathologist and photographer already at work. Morse had to breathe through his handkerchief to block out the sour smell of malt. He went to peer through the little hatch and saw on the floor of the vat below him a clearing in the chaff where Trevor Radford's body had lain. Chief Inspector, I'm Dr. Halliday. Your first case, Doctor? Yes. They've uh, thrown me in at the deep end. <laughs> like the deceased. Morse grimaced at the pathologist's whip. Didn't drown. It's too early to say. There's a depressed fracture front left of skull with a circular point of impact. Some heavy blunt instrument, perhaps. Time? That's a difficult one. They say the temperature in there is 55 degrees. That would have speeded things up a bit. Approximately. <laughs> well, the body's cold, so... It must have been at least eight hours ago. Probably near a ten. Assuming he was pushed in immediately after he was hit on the head. Around ten yesterday evening. What would you have been doing here at that time of night? I think I can help you there, Inspector. Norman Weeks, Marketing Director. Yes, Mr. Weeks. Trevor had been burning the midnight oil quite a lot lately, ever since farmers announced their offer. Farmers? Of Banbury? They're trying to take us over. Trevor was preparing what he called a defence document to be circulated to the shareholders. 
Well, that would explain why he was on the premises. It doesn't explain what he was doing in here. No. Where's his office? Weeks led Morse upstairs. Some petty thief, probably. Wandering to the yard, found the door open. Anything missing? Gail! A smartly dressed, attractive young woman turned towards them. Anything missing? No, I don't think so. This is Gail, our secretary. She was the last person to see Trevor alive. Except for the murderer. Well, yes, naturally. Weeks opened the door to Radford's office. Morse, Lewis and Gale followed him in. The walls were lined with old sepia photographs of the brewery. You say he was preparing a defense document. Just Where is it? tell me where everything is here. Could be in the safe, but I don't have the keys. And private things in the other drawer. 1841. The brewery's been in the Radford family all that time. Nearly 150 years. No wonder they don't want to sell. What time did you leave last night? Just after six. I offered to stay on, but Mr. Radford said he didn't need me. Excuse me, sir. Lewis was holding a crumpled piece of carbon paper and the scorched fragment of a letter dated three years ago. Who's Mr. John Wheatley? The company surveyor. Why would Mr. Radford be writing a letter to him dated 10th of June, 1986? I haven't the slightest idea. Morse examined the carbon against the light. Seems to have made a copy. I suppose that could be in the safe too. How many work here? Ten in the brewing area, about fifty in the other departments. I want every employee interviewed, Lewis. Then get a search organized. Tell the lads they're looking for a heavy, blunt instrument. Right, sir. Morse handed Lewis the piece of carbon paper. Take this back to the office, give them the back of transcript. Now, what do we know about the late Mr. Radford? Married? Shortly afterwards, Morse's red jaguar drew up in the leafy grounds of a large house on the outskirts of Oxford. It was a beautiful sunny June morning. Morse got out of the car, but before he walked to the front door, he hesitated and took a deep breath. This was the part he always hated. The hoovering inside stopped when the doorbell rang, and an elderly housekeeper in a print dress answered. Mrs. Radford, please. She's not up yet. Wake her, will you? It's important. You better come in. Shut the door behind you. Mrs. Radford! Yes, I can hear you. There's a policeman to see you. Morse had wandered out of the oak-beamed hall into a pretty yellow drawing room full of flowers when Helen Radford breezed in, still wearing pyjamas and a silk dressing gown. She looked surprisingly young to be Trevor Radford's wife. You're a policeman? Yes. If it's about that parking ticket, I paid it yesterday. It's not about a parking ticket. Someone's dead. Yes. Who is it? Isabel. Charles. I'm afraid it's your husband. Oh, my God. She slumped down onto the divan. 
Morse reached out a hand tentatively, not knowing quite what to do. Then a noise at the door made him go over and open it. The housekeeper had been listening intently on the other side. I wonder if you'd make us both some coffee. Please. Mrs. Radford's just had a very nasty shock. All right. I'll take mine black. No sugar. Car accident? No. He was murdered. Murdered? Last night at the brewery. Brewery. Look, Mrs. Radford, there are a few questions I have to ask, but uh, I can come back. I, uh, I went to bed early, you see. I took a sleeping pill. Mrs. Radford. All the time I was asleep, he was... Well, I never thought to look. I just assumed he'd come and gone again. I don't think you ought to be alone. Is there anyone you'd like me to call? How was he? He was, um, hit on the head and pushed into a vat. Stephen. Could you call Stephen? My brother-in-law. Number. It's in the book by the phone. Under Radford Future Tech. Ask him to tell his parents. I'll meet him there in an hour. Would you like me to drive you? Back in the brewery, evening the head brewer. Who else knew Mr. Radford was working late last night? Oh, everyone. I mean, we all knew about farmers' offer and about the governor trying to fight it off. You were all behind him? Of course. We produce some of the finest real ale in the country. So everyone's against farmers' bed, right? Well, everyone at the brewery. And what about the family? Oh, well, family. No accounting for them, is it? Take the brother for one, Mr. Stephen. You and Mr. Trevor never did see eye to eye. Always arguing about this and that. Well, only last week. Well, we all heard him. Trevor saying us how he needed more time to pull the brewery round. And Mr. Stephen. <laughs> I don't think he thought Mr. Trevor could organise a proverbial, even in his own brewery. driving Helen Radford to the family home when a call came through on the radio. Alpha Sierra One, are you receiving? Morse? Go ahead, Alpha Sierra Three. It's Lewis, sir. Where are you? I'm driving Mrs. Radford to her in-laws. There's something you should know. According to one of the employees, Radford had a big bust up with his brother last week. Not now, Lewis. I told you, I'm with Mrs. Radford. Oh, right. I'll call you back. What's he suggesting? Morse pursed his lips. They were just arriving at Marston Lodge, a huge white neoclassical mansion in the country. When they stopped, Helen Radford jumped out of the car and ran inside without waiting. Mrs. Trevor, on behalf of the staff, may I say how sorry Thank I am. you, Jess. 
they're waiting for you. Uh, there's a policeman outside. Show him where to go, will you? Any sign of the murder weapon? Nothing yet. I'll tell him to keep looking. I'll uh, meet you at the pub later. The butler was still waiting with the door open. May I have your name, sir? Morse. Rank? That's important, is it? I have to announce you, sir. Chief Inspector. Please come in. Morse followed the butler through the house into an impressive formal drawing room. Heavy gilt framed paintings lined three walls, while the fourth looked out through a conservatory onto sweeping grounds. Chief Inspector Morse, madam. An elegant woman in her sixties stood up and turned to him. Behind her, Helen was being comforted by a dark, thick set man in a blazer. He was the first to speak. Ah, the Good Samaritan. Not entirely. I was coming anyway. You're in charge of the investigations, Inspector? Yes. Come over here. I'm Isabel Ranford. This is my husband and my son, Stephen. I didn't catch the name. Morse. Oh. You'll have to speak up. He's rather deaf. Charles Radford, a frail old man with a walking stick and hearing aid, came towards them. And, uh, what's he doing here? He's a policeman. He's come to ask some questions. Well, you're looming, Inspector. Do sit down. I can't bear people looming at me. Helen, come and sit next to me. Chin up, dear. We must all be very brave. Well? Who stands to benefit from your son's death? Benefit? From his will, you mean? Uh, not necessarily. I was thinking of the brewery. Who'll take over as managing director? Uh, what? What? Uh, the brewery, Mr. Radford. Who'll be the new manager? Uh, that is yet to be decided by the board. No, dear, it'll be farmer's decision. If the deal goes through. It will. You're not being much help, Mother. Mr. Morse wants to know who'd have been next in line if farmers hadn't intervened. I've no idea. Norman Weeks, I suppose. Or, uh, Victor Priest. Who? At the brewery, Lewis was interviewing Victor Priest, a boyish-looking young man who worked as a chemist. Where were you last night, Mr. Priest? At home, laying a new track for the Flying Scotsman. What? You must have heard of the Flying Scotsman. It's a steam locomotive. Or was, before they brought in these hideous new diesel things. This track, how long did it take? Three or four hours. I kept changing my mind, you see. I couldn't decide whether to take the North Allerton to Newcastle section along the coast through West Hartlepool and Sunderland or stick to the inland route through Bishop Auckland and Durham. So you were at home the whole evening? Anybody corroborate that? Yes, my mother. Just then, Victor's mother was at home doing the ironing. And the main local story is at 11 o'clock. Police are baffled by the death of Trevor Radford, managing director of Radford's Brewery, whose body was found in one of the fermenting vats early this morning. As she listened to the bulletin, her face grew tense, the ironing forgotten. And appears to have been attacked as he left his office. She switched the radio off, but the shirt was ruined. Oh, blast! Oh. At Marston Lodge, Morse continued to direct his questions to Isabel Radford without much success. This offer for the brewery, I understand it caused some disagreement in the family. Who told you that? Is it true? Yes. We did disagree about it. We still do. But I fail to see what bearing that has on my son's death. 
I'm just trying to establish a motive, Mrs. Radford. My dear Inspector, I don't know what circles you move in, but in this family we're not in the habit of murdering each other every time we have a disagreement. They know about your row with Trevor, Stephen. Someone at the brewery told them. So you think I may have killed my brother, do you? Because we had a row. Would you mind telling me where you were last night? Around 10 o'clock. I was driving back from Bristol. Alone? And what were you doing in Bristol? Oh, really? This is intolerable. I don't mind, Mother. I had a meeting with Tremolo Computers. My company makes their printed circuit boards. What time did your meeting end? About seven. I stopped off to have something to eat. Where? Well, some Italian place. I can't remember the name. Paid by credit card, did you? No. It came to under 20 pounds, so I paid cash. What time did you arrive home? That's enough, horse. We've been very patient. But if all you're going to do is stand there and virtually accuse poor Stephen of Trevor's murder, then none of us has anything further to say. The Chief Inspector's leaving, Jessop. Show him out, will you? Inwardly furious, Morse decided to bide his time and left Master Lodge without protest. He went to visit their competitor, Farmers, which in contrast to Radford's was a prosperous modern brewery. George Lineker, the managing director, was waiting for him in the forecourt. I thought it might be you. Hello, George. Why is that? Oh, you know, murder inquiry, beer involved. I'll give it to Morse, I thought. Really? Make beer as well, here. Yeah. Good old Morse. Always the Puritan. Purist. Never wanted to make fine distinctions, were you? We've both been out in the real world a long time. Knocks the corners off. Yes. Makes them easier to cut, I suppose. Getting the grand tour, am I? Hello, the Farmers Brewery International. How may I help you? All right, uh, but he's not in the office at the moment. It's a long way from Sparta, George. Sorry? The little club we ran at Oxford. Or you ran, I should say. Yes, the Society for the Promotion of Traditional Real Ale. I never worked out what the first A stood for. Boys games more. It's a competitive world out there. So I keep hearing. If you get Radford's, who'll run it? You haven't got it yet. Someone from Radford's, or will you put your own man in? It's a corporate decision. So Trevor Radford couldn't hack it, is that the story? What? Oh, Trevor Radford's no longer the issue. That's one way of putting it. Look, Radford's is a sick company. Bad marketing, bad pricing structure, bad financial strategy. You need somebody, as the Americans say, to kick ass. Their freehold's worth quite a bit, too. I'm not an asset stripper, Morse, so don't come to Guardian Editorial with me. We're talking commercial synergy here. Either Radford gets an injection of outside capital, the whole lot goes down the tube and the family with it. I'm their white knight, Morse. But who's the dragon, George? Meanwhile, in the country, the Radfords were lunching out in the grounds. One of us will have to keep an eye on the brewery. I will. Won't it be too much for you, dear? What about your own business? It's only a week to the board meeting, Mother, and it'll give me a chance to do some detective work. Oh, what was that? Detective work, Dad. I want to find out why Farmer's offer was so low. There's no mystery about that. Every predator makes a low sighting shot. Not this low. It bears no relation to our asset value. 
I think farmers know something we don't. Well, I'd leave it to the meeting if I were you. Don't rock the boat. Oh, what do you mean, don't rock the boat? I'm trying to keep it afloat, for God's sake, till farmers rescue us. Oh, stop it! Trevor's dead, for God's sake. All you can do is talk about the value of your bloody assets. In an Oxford back street, Alfred Nelson, solicitor, left his office and bought the local paper, pausing as he scanned the front page with its headline, Murder at Radford's Brewery. He stared at the photograph of Trevor Radford and then hurried back inside. By now it was lunchtime and Lewis met Morse in the Trout Inn by the river. Morse was staring reflectively at the water. Copy of the transcript, sir. Dear Mr. Wheatley, I've just received your revaluation of our assets, which frankly astonishes me. I feel I must put on record my opinion that your estimates are, without exception, far too high. Oh, give it to me, Lewis. Far too high. I realize that land values have increased dramatically over the last few years, but even taking this into account, I cannot agree. Don't slurp in my ear, Lewis. I cannot agree that a 200% increase overall is justified. Perhaps we should meet to discuss the matter. Yours sincerely, Trevor Radford. Why would Radford have dated that letter three years ago? And why would he have burnt the top copy? Any ideas, Lewis? There's got to be something to do with the takeover. The motive, I mean. It's got to be financial. Maybe. But I think it's also to do with a family feud. What, the brother, Stephen? Well, not just Stephen, the father, the mother, the sister-in-law. I had the distinct impression that every one of them was being economical with the truth, as if they were closing ranks. Death always makes people close ranks. Death and money. And Trevor's death has certainly cleared the way for the sale of the brewery. But who would benefit from the takeover? The Radford family, certainly. Farmers. And the new managing director. There were two candidates. Uh, Norman Weeks and Victor Preece. Yeah, I interviewed both of them. And? There are boys, check out. All right, well, let's go and talk to the surveyor. Helen drove up to the door of her home. She had a passenger, Stephen Radford. You okay? Do you want me to come in? Better not. He lifted her face towards him and took off her sunglasses, revealing cheeks stained with tears. Helen. He leaned towards her and kissed her forehead, then her mouth. Helen wrapped her arms around him and held him tightly. Mm. After lunch at the pub, Morse and Lewis paid a visit to the surveyor, John Wheatley. What makes you think he typed this last night? Because he made a copy of the carbons in the waste paper basket. Well, this isn't the original. No. Well, what happened to it? He burnt it. How oh, very odd. I really can't help you, Chief Inspector. I've no idea why you should have decided that my valuation was excessive. You didn't disagree with it at the time. On the contrary, you seemed completely satisfied. And since then, you've had no cause to revise your figures? I wasn't asked to revise them. 
Could Bradford's change of mind have anything to do with farmers offer for the brewery? Well, that wouldn't make sense. Because whether or not the bid was successful, he wanted the valuation to be as high as possible. Is that a copy of the valuations? Of course. Could we see it? Weakly slammed the drawer shut, and they went outside. What's the matter with you, Lewis? Don't you have enough paperwork? Oh, I might have a bearing, sir. Thought they might have been killed to stop them selling that badly. Why? Oh, I've no idea. But he burnt it, so he obviously never intended to send it. We don't know it was him that burned it. Were there any other prints on it? None that we could find. Not much of a theory, then, is it? Well, do you have one? Not yet. But there's something very interesting about this case. What? Everyone we've talked to so far is hiding something, including that surveyor. Victor Priest, meanwhile, was at home with his mother, preparing her insulin injection. Trevor Radford must have told the family. They must know that he wanted you to take over as manager. Maybe. Anyway, it's all academic now. Not necessarily. You can always tell them that you were Radford's choice. It doesn't work like that, Mother. The family will make their own appointment. <laughs> oh, the police won't bother you anymore, will they? You're the one who's lost out. Yes. I'm going to have to... What's the expression? Consider my position. Don't be silly, Victor. You mustn't resign. I'm a qualified chemist. I'll have no trouble finding another job. But we must stay here in Oxford. Oh, no, I couldn't face another move. There you go. Thank you. Can you phone Bullens for me today? All right. Ask me if my guardsman has come in yet. Okay. Oh, by the way, don't bother about dinner tonight. <coughs> Cynthia Priest angrily dropped the dishes she was carrying and made as if to call after him, but did not. After seeing Wheatley, Morse and Lewis went to visit Stephen Radford and his family. Mrs. Radford gone shopping with his children. Be back soon. It's all right if we wait, isn't it? I'm sure it's okay. The Filipino maid showed them in to wait by the indoor pool, which was complete with sofas, a cocktail bar, and sliding glass walls opening onto the large garden. Suit so your kids this, Lewis? Lewis shrugged. It was a different world. Then Thelma Radford came in. She was expensively dressed, sophisticated, and carrying a box of plants. Thank you. Keep an eye on the children there in the pool. Mrs. Radford? Yes? I'm Chief Inspector Morse. This is Sergeant Lewis. I was wondering when you were going to get round to me. Oh. Last and definitely least. How can I help you, Chief Inspector? Your husband told us he had a business meeting in Bristol the day before yesterday. Really? You didn't know? <laughs> I'm not interested in his meetings. They can be in Timbuktu for all I care. What time did he arrive home, Mrs. Rutherford? He's a suspect, is he? Well, I expect someone told you that Trevor and Stephen didn't get on. Is it true? Yes. Poor old Trevor made rather a mess of things at the brewery and Stephen gave him hell. He's the one with the head for business, you see. Trevor was too proud to take his advice. And they disagreed about whether or not to accept Farmer's offer. Well, I think both of them would like to have kept the brewery going if it hadn't been losing money. Stephen was just trying to salvage something from the wreck, that's all. So what time did he get home from Bristol? I've no idea. You weren't here? I was asleep. 
What time did you go to bed? No. Let me see. I was uh, watching television and then the bloody horse of the air show came on, so I went to bed. Must have been about half past eleven. Uh, you didn't ask him why he was so late? You don't have that sort of marriage, Mr. Morse. But Marston Lodge, Isabel Radford looked at her husband asleep in the conservatory. Charles. She went to him and turned up his hearing aid. The police may wish to ask us some more questions. Be careful what you say to them, won't you? Why? We have some dirty linen. We don't want it washed in public. What dirty linen? To do with the family. I don't know what you're talking about. Yes, you do. Do I? You must have slipped my mind. Good. Excuse me, madam. Mr. Linnaker is here. Isabel, my dear. I don't know what to say. Nothing, George. But it's kind of you. What's he here for? Come to offer my Charles. I'm so sorry. Oh. I suppose you think it's just a formality now. What? Our acceptance. I suppose you think it's a foregone conclusion. He hasn't come to talk business, dear. Don't be so uncivil. Who can't believe it? Who on earth would want to kill him? Yes. He's such a harmless boy. A little out of his depth, perhaps. That's what I find so hard to bear. The fact that he wasn't a success. He never really achieved anything. It's not easy, the brewery business. You know as well as I do, if Stephen had been running the brewery, it would still have been viable. And you'd have had to pay a lot more for it. In the waste ground near Radford's brewery, a team of police were searching through the long grass and bushes. Someone reached into a water tank and pulled out a round-headed hammer. Sarge! Back at the station, Morse brought the hammer into his office where Lewis examined it. Any print? Life's never that easy, Lewis. I've just been on the Tremolo computers in Bristol. Eh? I did have a meeting with Stephen Lockford on the day of the murder. But it finished at six, not seven. All right. Let's give him the benefit of the doubt. Let's say he went for a meal before driving home. Let's be generous. Let's say the meal took an hour and a half. The drive back couldn't have taken more than an hour and a half. So he could have been in Oxford well before 9.30. He didn't get home till after 11.30 which puts him right in the frame. And his wife didn't seem too keen to get him out of it. Bitter. She seemed very bitter. Well, you think so? That was a curious phrase she used. Last and definitely least. But many that are first shall be lost, and the last shall be first. Very good, Lewis. Where'd you pick that up? Sunday school, sir. And what's its relevance? It means that one of these days I'm going to be a chief inspector. And you're going to be a sergeant, sir. In a phone booth in the city centre, the solicitor, Nelson, dialed a number. It's Nelson. In view of the recent tragedy, I think we should meet. Don't you? to discuss the future.
Morse and Lewis drove towards the high-tech steel and glass building which housed Stephen Radford's computer company. I rang a mate of mine on the Oxford Mail and he confirmed what I'd already heard at the brewery. It's been running at a loss for several years. So why does he think farmers want to take it over? For the land. It's a prime site. He reckons they'll close the place down, sell off the land to a development company. They've done it before. I know. Chief Inspector Morse, Thames Valley Police, Mr. Radford. One thing that puzzles him, though, why the offer is so low? He says it's nothing like what it should be worth. Upstairs, they found a hive of quiet activity where several white-coated employees were building circuit boards. Stephen Radford saw them arrive and frowned. What is it now? Just a few more questions, sir. All right, but make it quick. I'm up to my eyes today. You're not interested in helping us find your brother's killer? Not if you're trying to pin it on me. What time did you arrive back in Oxford the day before yesterday? Here we go again. We're going again because we didn't get an answer the first time. I'm sorry, I really don't remember. You must have some idea. Uh, nine, ten, eleven? Well, let's see. I left Bristol just after eight, so it must have been about half past nine. And you drove straight home? No. No. According to your wife, you hadn't returned when she went to bed at 11.30. And your meeting finished at 6, which leaves five or six hours unaccounted for. I'd arranged to meet someone. In Oxford? Yes. Oh. I'm afraid I can't tell you. A woman? You must draw your own conclusions. Oh, I came to my own conclusions some time ago, Mr. Radford. Helen Radford ran to the door when she heard the bell and was surprised to find her sister-in-law. Oh, I thought it was Trevor. When I heard the doorbell, he was always losing his key. I thought about phoning, but then I thought, well, that's the easy way, so... How are you bearing up? All right. You can get sunk in yet. Family rallying round? Yes. Everyone's been very kind. Good. If Stephen and I can do anything to help Helen, you will let us know, won't you? Thank you, Thelma. Thelma ran her fingers over the photographs of Helen and Trevor that lined the mantelpiece. He wouldn't want you to be alone. Unless, of course, you prefer it. One of us could stay with you, if you like. No. No, that won't be necessary. Sure you don't want me to send Stephen around? I mean, he could sleep on the sofa or something. Just till you're over the worst. I wouldn't dream of imposing on him. He's got enough on his plate as it is. He wouldn't mind. He can sleep anywhere, it makes no difference to him. Shall I lend him to you for a while? Dangerous. I might want to keep him. Thelma sat down beside her and stroked Helen's wrist. He is very unreliable, you know. A lot of unexplained absences. Really? Mm. That's why the police came to see me. They wanted to know where he was the night that Trevor died. Yes, well, uh, it was the police who brought me the news. Chief Inspector in charge of the case. He uh, drove me over to Isabel's. Really? 
He seemed to pick. That made Isabel very angry. I can imagine. Still, it's not absolutely impossible, is it? What do you mean? Well, Trevor was in his way, wasn't he? At the brewery, I mean. It's the old Esau and Jacob thing. One brother depriving the other of his birthright. Helen shifted uncomfortably on the sofa. Amid the constant din at Bradford's brewery, Martin Weeks was dictating a letter to Gail. May we therefore beg your indulgence of the settlement of your account and trust that meanwhile deliveries of barley will continue as usual. Yours faithfully, etc. What do you think? Sounds all right. Weeks came over and rested his hand on her bare shoulder. Should buy us some time? She flinched away from his touch. Yes, let's hope. We'll need time to make sure it gets the evening post, okay? He sat down at his desk, but kept watching, staring at the back of her neck. He got up again and leant over her, his mouth close to her ear. You're wasting your time, you know. Hitching your wagon to the wrong star. What do you mean? I mean, when farmers take over, I shall still be here. Victor won't. And how do you know that? Never mind. Just take my word for it. In the office, Lewis handed Morse a sheaf of papers. Pathologist reported. Give me the gist. Well, the blow to the head didn't kill him. He drowned. He's been attacked as he left the office. Probably on the staircase leading down to the main door. So he could have been hiding behind one of those big copper things. Tons, Lewis. They're called tons. It's where the brewers make the mash. All right, then. Tons. I mean, it's been pretty dark in there. So he leaks out. What makes you so sure it was he? Well, it couldn't have been a woman. She'd have to drag him all the way back up the staircase. Bradford didn't weigh all that much. A strong woman, a fit woman, could have dragged him into the mashing room and lifted him into the vat. Tons. Didn't he say that's what it was called? When Stephen Radford arrived home from work, the children ran to meet him. How are you doing? Mm. What you been doing? He walked inside to the pool where Thelma was preparing to dive in. Stephen poured himself a large whiskey. I went to see Helen this afternoon. How is she? Oh, prostrate with grief. Is there anything we can do? Well, I would offer to lend you to her. Lend me to her? I thought she might like the company. A manly shoulder to cry on. I told her I could do without you for a few days. Very generous of you. Well, she shouldn't be alone at a time like this. I wouldn't be any use to her. I only get on her nerves. Did you get a visit from the police today? Yes, you? Yes. You seem to be a suspect. They wanted to know why you were home so late the night before last. What did you tell them? I told them I had no idea. I'm afraid I'll probably be late again tonight. I have to go to the brewery. See if I can plug a few holes in the sinking ship. Plug away, darling. Victor, meanwhile, had come home to a barrage of questions from his mother. 
That tart at the brewery, is it? Don't start all that again. Common little secretary. I wish you'd find a girl of your own class. Someone you could bring home. Why can't I bring Gail home? Because she'd only get ideas, that's why. What ideas? This isn't exactly a palace, Mum. If she was a gold digger, she'd probably run a mile. I think you're being very selfish. My blood sugar was all wrong this morning. What if I have one of my funny turns? I'll ask Mrs. Gremble to look in. What about my guards van? Sorry, I forgot. Oh, for Christ's sake. I'll need it for the weekend. No, no, I promise I'll ring Bullens tomorrow. No, don't bloody bother. I'll do it myself. It was after seven when Stephen arrived at Radford's brewery to find Norman Weeks on the point of leaving. Good luck, Stephen. Bit of a horror story, I'm afraid. Let's hope I can give it a happy ending. Happy for the Radfords or us minions? For us all. You sure you wouldn't like me to stay behind? I know as much about the financial situation as anybody. No thanks, Norman. If I have any questions, I'll call you. Weeks got into his car and sat there fuming. In his office, Morse was making a list of all the suspects on a blackboard. He divided them into family and employees. There should be another column too, sir. Headed farmers. Oh, come on, Lewis. You think they hired a hit man to knock off the opposition? You've been watching too many American movies. Oh, I admit it's a long shot, sir. But there's a lot of money at stake. They didn't have to kill Radford. All they had to do was improve their bid, make the family an offer they couldn't refuse. That evening, Victor and Gail were having dinner in a Chinese restaurant. Still trying it on, isn't it? This sort never stops. I think you're right about him and farmers. Gave the game away this afternoon. Oh? Told me I was wasting my time with you because after Farmers took over, he'd still be there, but you wouldn't. I knew it. I knew that bastard was feathering his own nest. So what will you do? Start looking for another job. In Oxford? Yes. I'm settled here now. She doesn't want to move again. There's enough of an upheaval three. It's her idea, though. She wants to come south. Why? Her great-granddad used to live around here. The only one in our family that had a bit of money, so she thought the streets of Oxford must be paved with gold. I'd like to meet your mum. really like to see your trains, Victor. Charles Radford was alone in his study when the phone rang. It was Stephen. Hello. Dad? I'm afraid it's worse than we thought. I think you ought to come over. No, 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 no. You handle it. Do whatever you have to do. What I ought to do is go to the police. Y yes, I know. You mean you knew what Trevor was up to? Yes, Stephen. And I'm sorry you had to find out. He hung up. In another room, Isabel carefully replaced the receiver of the extension. home, Helen Radford leafed automatically through a magazine 
then glanced to the open window where the breeze was stirring the curtains. The sun was setting. The mantelpiece clock began chiming nine. At the police station, Morse was still in his office, thinking. As the clock struck, he went over to the blackboard with its list of suspects and drew a circle around the name Stephen. Feeling a sudden chill, Helen got up and closed the windows. A little later, Helen was drawing up in the staff car park outside Radford's brewery. The only other car there was Stevens. She got out and peered into it. Seemingly puzzled, she looked around her as if expecting him to be there. Eventually, she went into the building. The familiar, incessant roaring of the machines almost drowned her footsteps as she climbed the thin metal staircase. Stephen! She hurried on up the stairs and paused, looking round, getting worried. As she peered across to the balcony on the other side, she caught a glimpse of something, a pale figure staring at her. But it was only her own distorted reflection in a glass door. She ran up the spiral staircase to what had been Trevor's office. Even there, although the lamps were on, there was no sign of Stephen. It was untidy, as though he was in the middle of something. She left the empty room and went downstairs again, looking around the main part of the brewery, among the machines the labyrinth of metal piping, the huge vats. Her mouth was dry with fear. Her husband's killer had hidden among these shadows. As she glanced down through the railings, she saw something odd and bent down to peer more closely. Down on the brewing floor, in a big copper fermenting tank, something was lying in the mash that shouldn't have been. Helen ran down another flight of stairs to get a better look. The body of a man lay drowned in the white glutinous substance the body of Stephen Radford. Later that night, when Morse arrived at Radford's brewery, Helen Radford was still in a state of shock. She sat on an upturned barrel, and once again Morse felt powerless in the face of her grief. He looked up at the pathologist. Same modus operandi. Identical. Different weapon, though. Something long and flat, like uh, an iron bar or something. Isn't there something you ought to have told me, Mrs. Radford? We were going to spend the night together. 
when he didn't turn up, I came looking for him. I can't believe it. I just can't believe it. That it could happen again. I tried to break it up with him. I was... <sighs> about your sister-in-law. She knew. Not that she ever said anything. Just dropped heavy hits. No way of getting back at me. Did you call her? No, I thought. Who's you think I'm a bitch? I did try. I really did. <laughs> the next morning, Thelma Radford dived into her mosaic tile pool and swam alone. She climbed out in front of a bemused morse and pulled her bathrobe around her. seem to be taking it remarkably calmly, Mrs. Radford. Mm -hmm. Did you love your husband? Thelma leant over and switched off the tape player. I married him for all this. That's what his bloody family thinks. I was his secretary and then I did his PR. We spent a lot of time together. He must have been quite a catch. So it'd be difficult to believe, Inspector, but so was I. No. No, I don't find that difficult to believe. very physical thing, you see. We couldn't keep our hands off each other. I got pregnant. And I insisted on him doing the honorable thing. So there I was. A beautiful baby. Married. Until death us. Sorry, I didn't mean... No, no, not at all. <laughs> you see, marriage brings you down to earth as such a bump. <laughs> I expect you know all about that. Have you managed to keep your illusions? I've never put it to the test. Really? Extraordinary. Did that really come? Did he? Bachelor Gay, am I? Mm -hmm. How does that song go? Though I suffer from Cupid's dart. Right. You look the faithful type. One woman at a time, man. Do I? You do. Quite a catch. And Stephen wasn't? What? A one woman at a... a one woman man. <sighs> well. I soon learned I didn't have exclusive rights. 
saw lots of women before Miss Horse of the Year show. So you knew about Helen? Of course I knew about Helen. I knew about all of them. And how did you feel? How do you think I felt? As was a physical relationship, take that away. And I knew it would happen one day. And I was fat and middle-aged, but I was still in pretty good nick, wouldn't you say? Of course, I felt disappointed. Why didn't you divorce him? Don't think I haven't thought that. Well, what the hell? I'd lose more than I'd gain. I mean, I've got the Radford name. The bank manager loves that beautiful house. Two wonderful children. I'll settle for that. She switched the tape player on again and got up. Where were you last night between 8.30 and 10? See. Sing. The local operatic society. Oh, you're doing La Traviata. That's right. You're playing Violetta? No. No, I'm just a member of the chorus. In their cramped Paris house on the other side of Oxford, Victor's model trains raced round their track while he brought his mother her breakfast. See, ma'am. Thank you, dear. Did you have a good time last night? Yes, thanks. How are you sleeping with her? What? The girl, has she got a flat? A room of her own. She lives with her parents. Did she ask you that last night? Drink your tea while it's hot, Mum. Oh, well, no trouble was cooking the books. Maybe Stephen was in on it. Maybe our murderer found out. You don't kill someone because they're cooking the books, Lewis. All you have to do is expose him. But it can't be a coincidence it's all blown up now, just after Farmer's offer. I think we should have a talk to Farmer's. I'll do that. I want you to go back to Radford's. We interview all the employees, check their alibis. I'm going to have a couple of hours sleep and then go and see the parents. They'll be shattered. It must be terrible to lose both sons in the same week. I'm sure they'll survive. You don't like that family, do you? Looks like I'm not the only one. But when you're at the brewery, find out if they've sacked anyone lately. Lewis hung a do not disturb sign outside Morse's off of the brewery. In St. Aldgate's, Nelson, the solicitor, was just arriving at work. Morning, Shirley. Morning. I suppose you've heard the news. News? There's been another murder at Radford's brewery. What? I heard it on the car radio. It's the brother, the one who started the electronics room. Good God. Makes you wonder who'll be next, doesn't it? Nelson sat down heavily, suddenly preoccupied. Shelley? Yes, Mr. Nelson? Cancel my appointments for this afternoon, would you? I have to go out. At Marston Lodge, the Radfords butler made Morse wait in the hall while he announced him. Chief Inspector Morse, madam. Can't this wait? I'm afraid not, Mrs. Radford. It's possible you may be in danger. Danger? You mean I'm next on the list? Or your husband. Anyone connected with the brewery. Please keep your voice down, Inspector. If there's some sort of threat, I don't want him to know about it. 
He's had enough shocks for one week. May I sit down? Mm -hmm. Has the family any uh, enemies that you know of? No, what on earth is going on? It's nothing important, dear. I'll deal with it. Oh. Enemies? Someone whose toes you've trodden on. Someone with a grudge. I expect a lot of people have grudges against us. We're well off. We have an extremely successful business. If it was so successful, why did Trevor have to borrow a million pounds from the bank? I've talked to the bank manager. It was uh, three years ago, just after the revaluation of your assets. Isabel got up and went to find her husband. Charles? What? Did you know about this? What? That Trevor took out a million pound loan three years ago. Yes. And he didn't pay it back. No, he did not. Well, that settles it. We shall have to sell. Meanwhile, Lewis was encountering some resistance from Norman Weeks. Look, Sergeant, I realize you've got a job to do. We're fighting for survival at the moment. One more day's loss of production will be very damaging. We'll be as quick as we can, sir. But we'll start with you, shall we? Now, where were you last night? At home. Well, all evening? Yes. And your wife will confirm that, won't she? No. I'm afraid she can't. It was her bridge night. She'd have left her long ago if it hadn't been for the children. They're my only grandchildren, you know, Inspector. And now, with both my sons gone. Thelma tells me that she knew all about her husband's affairs and she didn't care. Is that what she said? I think you'll find she cares very much about anything that threatens her security. And you don't blame her? Accidents will happen, even in the best regulated families. Mr. McCorber. <laughs> I thought it was W.C. Fields. <laughs> anyway, I'm very fond of Helen. This doesn't have to become public knowledge, does it? Depends on whether it has a bearing on the case. Of course it hasn't. Moore sighed and looked out into the garden where Charles was now practicing with his fishing rod. Lewis, in the meantime, had left the brewery and was walking past several old railway signs to the priest's home. The front door opened suddenly, and Nelson, the solicitor, rushed past him. Mrs. Priest? Yes, what do you want? Police! She opened the door, glaring at him. It's about the murder at the brewery. Murders. Plural. What? There's been another one last night. Mr. Radford's brother. We're rechecking everybody that works there. Matt, come in. But if you're checking up on Victor, he was out to dinner last night with a girlfriend. I know. What time did he arrive back? Not late. What about three nights ago, the night Trevor Radford was like killed? I told you that on, on the telephone. He was here the whole evening. Lewis pushed past her into the house. Perhaps we could talk about exactly what time he got back. After Morse had left, Isabel and Charles Radford walked along the river that ran through their grounds. I had no idea things were so bad. Why didn't you tell me? I didn't want to worry. I'm a shareholder, Charles. I have a right to know. He specifically asked me not to tell you. Why did he need the money? Expansion. 
expansion? Yes, he said he wanted to buy more tide houses. Said it would ensure our survival. But that should have been a board decision. He didn't think he was getting through the board. That's why he took out a personal loan. For a million pounds? But he didn't have the security. No. No, I guaranteed it. You mean you mortgaged the house? Yes. You fool! You bloody old fool! He assured me that he'd pay it back within five years. You'd never know. We must bring forward the board meeting to this afternoon. Oh, for heaven's sake, Isabel! At least let's wait until we bury them. No! This business has gone on long enough. We must make a decision before the weekend. Morse had returned to Farmer's Brewery. How well do you know the Radford family, George? Charles and my father are quite close friends. Then why are you trying to buy the brewery on the cheap? Come on, Morse. We made a perfectly fair offer. Based on your own valuation. Of course. Which doesn't seem to bear any relation to the Radford valuation. Well, we shall have to see, won't we? Our surveyor is usually pretty good. I think you'll find they'll accept. Especially now. Look, it's a terrible tragedy. Of course it is, but it makes no difference. We put in our offer nearly three weeks ago. And business is business. I'm afraid so. One's first duty is to one's shareholders. Is that why you approached Norman Weeks? Offered to make him managing director if your bid was successful? Who told you that? Is it true? You know Trevor Radford wanted to reject your offer? Yes, Charles told me. Why was the offer so low? I'm sorry, Morse. I don't quite see where this is leading. Would you like to confirm where you were last night, George? I was in the theatre. The local operatic society. Of which I am patron. I was with my wife and several friends. At Radford's brewery, Cynthia Priest was chatting to one of the staff when Dale came downstairs. You're gay. Yes. I'm Cynthia Priest, Victor's mother. Vic's in the lab. No, no, I came to see you. Oh. Are you sleeping with him? Well, that's none of your business. I'm sorry. I have to know. Why? You invited him home last night, didn't you? After your dinner. Look, why don't you ask me? I did. He wouldn't tell me. Well, I'm not going to tell you either. You stupid little tart. Why can't you leave him alone? Gail ran out of the building, pursued by Victor's mother, just as Charles and Isabel drew up in the car park to the board meeting. Cynthia stared at them with hatred. Yes, well, you all know why you're here, so I'll throw the meeting open to discussion. There's no time for discussion, Charles. We're in no position to refuse farmers' offer. It's the only one we're likely to get. But it's a quarter of what the company's worth, Isabel. We can't let it go at this price. We've no choice, dear. Of course we have a choice. If farmers won't increase their offer, we should reject it. I know that's what Trevor would have done. I'd leave Trevor out of this if I were you in view of his record. At least he accepted his responsibilities. But he didn't refuse them. Please, it's too late for recriminations. Well, I know how Stephen would have voted anyway. That's why I'm pledging his shares for acceptance. Are you sure he left them to you? Oh, yes. I spoke to the solicitor. Well, it's an ill wind, I suppose. I checked, too. It seems I'm the sole beneficiary of Trevor's will. It's 
So the least I can do is follow his wishes. I vote for rejection. Norman? I'm on this board as a representative of the workforce. So I must vote for a future which guarantees continuity of employment. And that future, in my opinion, lies with farmers. So I'm for acceptance. Well, Charles and I also vote to accept. And together with Thelma's shares... Uh, uh, just, just, just a moment, please. Just a moment, just a moment. I blame myself for the trouble we're in. I retired too early and I recommended Trevor to take my place. They were bad decisions, both of them, for which I apologise to the board, but I do not believe them to be irredeemable. What are you talking about, Charles? I've been searching my conscience these last terrible days. And, uh... I can't agree to the sale, not after a century and a half of continuous family control. My ancestors had turned in their graves and I could never sleep peacefully in mine. What's the point of holding on to the brewery now? We've no need of it. We have grandchildren. And in 20 years' in time... In 20 years, there'll be nothing to leave except massive debts. Um, Norman, can I ask you something? Do you believe the company can be turned round? Well, not without a complete reorganization of the sales and distribution departments. Could you do it? Me? Yes, if we gave you a free hand. Could you save the brewery? Yes, Mr. Radford. I believe I could. Then I propose we appoint Norman as the new managing director and reject Farmer's offer. No! This is our last chance to liquidize our assets. If we don't accept this offer, we'll have nothing. Not even a decent pension. I've lost two sons. And I'm damned if I'm going to spend an impoverished old age just because your bloody ancestors might turn in their graves. It's the living you should care about, Charles. Especially. I suggest we take a vote. Who's for acceptance? Four hundred and twenty thousand shares. And for rejection. Isabel got up and rushed out in tears. Charles struggled to his feet to follow her. Isabel paused outside to collect herself before getting into the car and driving off alone. Charles was too late to stop her.
It was Lewis. Morse looked blearily at his watch. The next morning, Lewis found Morse at home tinkering with his car. Morning, sir. Morning, Lewis. Don't they have telephones in your neighborhood? I did ring, sir. Several times. Don't hear the damn thing out here anyway. It's been another murder. I hope it's that landlord from the Cock and Bullfinch teaching to keep his beer properly. The brewery? No, sir. Not a problem then. I'm afraid it is, sir. Well, that's official, is it? Yeah. Chief Super thinks there could be a connection with the brewery murders. So he's giving us first crack at it. That's very generous of him. Put that wheel on, will you, Lewis? I'm just going to wash my hands. Shortly afterwards, Morse and Lewis let themselves into Nelson's office. The solicitor lay on the floor, his face and chest covered with blood. Blows to the body as well as the front and the back of the head, which completely shattered the skull. Any forensic connection with the brewery murders? No. This is different. Because it's messy. Right. Took several blows to kill him. Lewis held up the bloodstained receiver. Looks like he tried to phone for help. I've never seen anything like this attack. It was frenzied. Desperate then? Our killer? You have a theory, Lewis. Well, the brewery murders were premeditated, weren't they? Lewis went to let in the ambulance man. Single blows. Victims taken by surprise each time. Whereas this... Well, look. I can see, Lewis. Boy. Desperate. No. I think we're looking for two different killers. All right, take him away. Hang on a minute. I'm sure... I've seen this bloke somewhere before. Where? No idea. But his face is definitely familiar. Come and look, sir. I'll take your word for it, Lewis. Morse picked up an empty file marked Knox. He was out most of the afternoon, and then he came back and had a late appointment. Who is? Some woman. She didn't give her name. Said he'd know who it was. When was this appointment arranged? She phoned yesterday afternoon, just before I left. What exactly did she say? She said she wanted to see Mr. Nelson. No, 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 no. What exactly did she say? Exactly. Oh, let me think. She said something like, Would you ask Mr. Nelson to remain at the office? I shall be arriving just after six. May I see that, please? Just a few cancelled appointments yesterday afternoon. Two appointments the day before that. One the day before. Do you have a client named Knox? Knox? 
Find out what Nelson was interested in. Thank you. You've been very helpful. And the main news headlines at 10 o'clock. Alfred Nelson, a 45-year-old solicitor, was found battered to death in his St. Aldgate's office this morning. According to Chief Inspector Morse of the Thames Valley CID, the attack took place early yesterday evening. He's appealing for anyone who was in the vicinity of St. Aldgate's between 6 and 7 p.m. to come forward if they saw anything suspicious. In his room, Victor switched off the radio and went downstairs to the kitchen where his mother was loading the washing machine. She smiled at him, but his face was grim. Lewis grew up outside the county records office and prepared himself for a long stint. He wasn't looking forward to this. When Morse got home that night, he put on the aria from La Traviata that Thelma had been playing by the pool. He poured himself a large glass of whiskey and lay down on his sofa to wait for Lewis. Soon his mind filled with a blur of recent memories. There was Thelma's body gliding through the water, the strange brightly colored pattern on the bottom of her pool, a sort of tree of life. And then Stephen Radford's face, dripping with the slimy white mash. Startled out of his dream, Moore squinted at the window. Sir? It was Lewis. Morse looked blearily at his watch. Lewis, where have you been all day? You know exactly where I've been, sir. The county records office. Morse got up to let him in. What took so long? Long? You should have seen the papers. They've got half the Amazon rainforest in there. Papers? At the county records office, it's amazing. I none of them were catalogued. If I hadn't got lucky, I'd have been there all week. Lewis peered hopefully at a tray of bottles on the sideboard. Have a beer, Lewis. So you did get lucky. Ebenezer Knox. Born 1813 in Woodstock. Educated at Winchester and Balliol. Became the youngest justice of the peace in the county. Then in 1841, he and another man bought a piece of land. You never guess what the other man's name was. Radford. Right. Three murders in a week, Lewis. The chief super was right, there could be a connection. But the pathologist thought there was no connection with Nelson's murder. You're not listening, Lewis. Even if we're looking for two killers, they could still be connected. Well, you're right, Sid. Knox's partner's name was Timothy Radford. Radford and Knox started the brewery. Is there any evidence Radford bought Knox out? No. Mm. First thing next morning, Morse went back to visit Charles Radford. He found him dozing in the conservatory. He caught the bastard. Not yet. Did 
talked about what. No. It's you I came to see. Tell me about Ebenezer Knox. What? Ebenezer Knox. Where on earth did you dig him up? County Records Office. He was your great-grandfather's original partner, and I think he's the key to all this. He died more than a hundred years ago. Yes, yes, but not in Oxford. He seems to have been a very prominent citizen, but there's no record of him after 1850 when he sold his house in Woodstock. And there's no evidence he ever sold his half share in the brewery. I'm not sold. I certainly agreed to relinquish it. You know all about this, don't you? Eventually, Charles took more sound into the cellars. There was a whole network of them beneath the house. <coughs> Morse banged his head on a low-hanging lamp on the way down. Family archives? Yes. Just as my father left them. I know him. Great grandfather as well. Probably. Charles brought out a dusty cardboard box file. Inside were a number of old letters and documents. Sorry about the dust, I haven't been down here for years. Yeah. Morse took the letter and held it up in the light. To whom it may concern, I, the undersigned, hereby do solemnly and humbly swear to leave the city of Oxford forthwith and never return and that in exchange Timothy Radford of Marston Lodge, Oxford will provide me with the sum of 100 pounds each and every year for so long as I shall live signed Ebenezer Knox doesn't explain why. Um, no, but, uh, uh, this does. L look at the names of the parents. Ebenezer Knox, Margaret Fordham. Who was she? It was a newspaper. Cutting here. Oxford woman found guilty of vagrancy and prostitution. Third offence, jail for one year. So Knox left Oxford to avoid a scandal. And the date fits. The birth was registered in 1850. Where did he go? Somewhere in the northeast, I believe. He, he doesn't specify. According to this document, Knox agreed never to return to Oxford. But he didn't agree to give up his half share in the brewery. When Morse got back to the station, Lewis had some news for him. Northeast, you say? 1850-ish. Ebenezer Knox. Seems he cut quite a dash when he first came to Sunderland. A flashy high spender with a posh southern accent. He started another brewery with a blog called Beddles. Come into the office. Neither of them could have been much good at business because it pretty quickly went down the tubes. Beddles' son bought them out in the end. Where did all this come from? 
an old mate of mine too, in the history department at Newcastle University. There's a professor there, just written a book, uh, Drink and Sobriety in the Victorian Northeast. Knew all about Knox. I've already got this from Lineker's computer. Ah, oh, but that's not all, sir. Not quite. In 1852, Knox married a local girl. And they had a daughter who married a man named Priest. Oh. Interesting, eh? And then, I suddenly remembered where I'd seen that solicitor fellow Nelson before. Morris and Lewis set off for the Priest's house. What a pair they must have been. Who? Oh, Knox and Radford. One of them a hypocrite, the other a blackmailer. Blackmailer? Knox was a justice of the peace. A pillar of the community. So when a convicted prostitute gave birth to his child, she took the birth certificate to Radford. Radford probably paid her off and blackmailed Knox into leaving Oxford. Made him sign a letter promising never to return. There were several police cars already parked outside when Morse and Lewis arrived. Radford ever give him back his share? No, uh, give him a hundred pounds a year, a pittance. So technically, half the brewery still belongs to Knox's heirs. Not just technically, Lewis, legally. Can we come in, Mrs. Priest? Where's Victor, Mrs. Priest? Upstairs. Could you ask him to come down, please? Why? I think you know why, Mrs. Priest. He couldn't have done those murders. He was out with a girlfriend. We talked to her. On both nights, he left her around nine o'clock. And came straight home. I don't believe you, Mrs. Priest. I think you've been covering up for him. Cynthia sat down heavily. Out of the window she could see several uniformed officers waiting. Her shoulders drooped. Suddenly she seemed years older. This is Grand's fault. She should never have told him. About your claim on the brewery? That he'd been swindled out of his inheritance. That's a dangerous thing to tell a little boy. Especially a little boy who keeps his feelings bottled up all the time. But it was you who persuaded him to come here, to apply for the job at Radford's. He had the qualifications and we needed the money. To pay a solicitor. Nelson. But he told you your claim couldn't be substantiated. <laughs> Just my luck to hire a crook. <laughs> Which is your son's will? I'll show you. He took every single penny we had. And then when these murders started, he 
He tried to blackmail you. I told him we couldn't pay him any more. Even this house is rented. But he wouldn't listen. Victor. Put your jacket on, dear. I'm afraid you have to go to the police station. Victor sat down behind his transfer. Your mother's going too, Victor. You know he was with his girlfriend at the time of Melsey's death. You killed him, didn't you, Mrs. Grace, to protect your son? The WPC ushered a bewildered Cynthia Priest out of her house. Victor followed her downstairs. With his glasses on, he looked younger than ever, like a sulky boy. He stopped at the foot of the stairs and stared Morse in the eye. When I come out, I'll get you too. Out, you'll be long gone. It is a copper loose. You should have joined the diplomatic service. Something is worrying you, though. Yes. What? Loose ends. And a piece that doesn't fit. What does it matter, Chief Inspector? The boys are dead. Trevor's dead. You knew he committed a fraud? Fraud? What are you talking about? When did you find out, Mr. Radford? When he asked me to guarantee a bank loan, Trevor persuaded the surveyor to overestimate the brewery's assets, thus increasing the value of the shares. So he could borrow against them? Oh, no, it, it wasn't for personal gain. It was to save the brewery. It was still a fraud. And when farmers made their bid, he realized he was in danger of being found out. So he wrote a backdated letter to the surveyor expressing his disagreement with the high valuation. I knew that once George Lineker took a look at the books, the fraud would be exposed and it, uh, We couldn't have that. Oh, no, we couldn't have that, could we? The family reputation must be preserved at all costs. The magnificent Radfords. <laughs> For ten years you've been looking down your nose and smiling at me, and all the time... Dislock at you. I expect this is embarrassing you, Inspector. Please, it's all out in the open now, because... I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to say this. You never wanted me, did you? Just the grandchildren. My kids. So, now you're going to get your own way. But I'm taking them with me. And if you want to see them, you are going to have to whistle. Thelma Radford picked up her jacket and walked out. Well, 
an inspector. Must the evil that men do live after them? Or can it remain our secret? There's nothing I can prove, Mrs. Redford. I can't even prove the surveyor deliberately made a false valuation, so... Your son Trevor can rest in peace. and Lewis left Marston Lodge and set off back to the station. So there are more important things than money. What? Family honor. That's what Radford's care about. That's what he cares about. I'm not sure about her. I reckon she'll stay with him when the money runs out. They'll have to sell that house, won't they? Pay off the... Abruptly, Morse pulled over to the side of the road. Say that again. Say that again, what you just said. Well, I was just wondering whether she'd stay with him when the money runs. That's run. it, Lewis. You're a genius. You've cracked it. I thought we'd already cracked it. We cracked half of it, but we got the other half wrong. So, I'm a genius, am I? Yes. Because you talk like Mrs. Priest. You don't talk like Mrs. Radford. I'm not with you, sir. Isabel Radford wouldn't say stay. She'd say remain. So? Can it remain our secret? Can it remain our secret, she said. The woman that phoned Nelson's secretary told her to ask him to remain at the office. That'll be tenuous, isn't it? I shall be arriving just after six. Now, most people would have said I'll be there just after six, wouldn't they? Mrs. Priest certainly would. But Nelson was blackmailing Mrs. Priest. She admitted it herself. Only since the first murder, and only for pocket money. He was already playing for bigger stakes. Morse turned the car around and drove back to Marston Lodge, where Isabel was kneeling by her husband's chair, clutching his hands. about the blackmail. We'd have lost half the brewery. That odious little man, Nelson. He threatened to give it to the priests. I wasn't going to have those bloody people get their hands on our brewery. No. Oh, my God. You involved, Charles. Oh. If the deal had gone through, I'd have paid Nelson off for my share, and that would have been that. Oh, no, it wouldn't. He'd have come back for more. Blackmailers always do. Well. One problem he won't have to face now. Morse stepped in through the French windows. Is that you, Morse? 
I was just coming to see you. How kind of you to offer me a lift. As she stood up, Charles clung on to her and wouldn't let go. Quietly, she detached herself from his embrace and folded his hands on his lap. When she walked out, she didn't look back. At the station, Morse went to the cells to apologize to Cynthia Priest. We're arranging to have someone take you home, Mrs. Priest. You may still be charged with obstructing the course of justice. Cynthia got up, but stumbled at the door of the cell. You are. She walked up to Morse, looking at him with puzzled, resentful eyes. You're alone again now. She turned away. An old woman now. Yes, I suppose you will. Lewis was waiting outside. When Cynthia came out, he opened the door of the police car for her. She got in, ignoring it. As the car sped away, Lewis turned to find Morse beside him. Fancy a pint, sir. Do you know, Lewis? I'm not absolutely sure I do.